It is indeed. Cool. Um, it is indeed. This is uh, the deep field. I, I just love that one of the first photographs they released was a redo of the Hubble deep field photograph so that you could really do a comparison. I think it was just total genius. Mm -hmm. And this is 12 and a half hours sitting on the same piece of real estate in the sky for what took two weeks of light gathering for Hubble. So the difference is like crazy. What I read is that, that the picture we're looking at is like a grain of sand held out at arm's length. That's how tiny that little piece of space is. Like, Yep. Yep. And it's crowded. Life is more crowded than we think. Football is life. Oh, weird. Where'd that come from? Hey, Pete. Greetings, everyone. Uh, I missed you, Pete. Uh, yeah. yeah. Where did you miss me? Or it's just, it's <laughs> he threw something at you, but didn't actually hit. That's, I think, what he means. <laughs> Football is life. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop now before I get into more trouble. Good morning, Gil. Good morning. Hardly have a few people in the call, and we've already got two ducks. How's that happening? <laughs> do we have a, did anybody suggest a topic? Yes, yeah, Stacy put a topic in the Mattermost chat, which I will read out unless Stacy would like to read it out. But Stacy is busy manufacturing coffee. Yeah, read it out, and then I'll be back to add my share. <laughs> Sounds good. And then I, uh, I have a, a topic that might actually sort of fit alongside that. Oh, look, Pete just copied it into the chat and I will read it from there instead of flipping around to the memo. <clears throat> Thanks, Pete. Fast. Um, so Stacy writes, do our thoughts match our actions? Which ones create our reality? What are we creating for our future as a result of our present mindset? This, direct relates, this directly relates to the flawed approach we are using when we're trying to tackle climate change. What are the blind spots causing our systems thinking model to malfunction? Until we repair those parts in our own minds, we will not be able to think our way into a better future. And the share that I have works out perfectly with your background because it has to do with um, the polarity with people. So I was on Facebook because with the hearings, I figured this is a really good opportunity. But the first thing I noticed is that one of the friends that I have, who does, he's a big climate activist, big climate activist, does beautiful movies, is, is all over. He has this very inflammatory post about what you guys are all so excited about. And he's like, this is what they spend money on. And he goes about, and it's really inflammatory. So I private message him. And if I can put my private messages in the chat, I will. If not, I'll try to find a way to share it when I don't, you know, and I'll just read you it because I know that probably like Bentley or Jack or Mark Antoine would want to hear how I structured the dialogue. But we had this whole conversation and I said, listen, I'm just reaching out to you. And I said, is that really the way you want to do it? You know, I used what, however I spoke to him and he got, you know, he was like, well, why it's ridiculous. And I go through listening to what he says and basically he wants to know why does that you know like what's the problem i said do you realize that most of the people that are so excited that you've now insulted they are your allies they're the ones you're splitting off from so he's like well i don't see so i said why don't you talk to your wife because i know his wife would get it because i'm i'm going down the spiritual aisle with him which is where his wife would meet him but he's he's in you know libertarian kind of he's not a libertarian but he's of that you know, the Bernie mindset. So final, so finally, I just said, you know, I was exhausted because I've been trying to work on other things. I'm really, really tired. But this was important. So I said to him, listen, I just got to go to bed. I said, but this is why Trump won. So he said, yeah, you better go to bed because you're not even making any sense. Okay. <laughs> All right. And just for, just for clarity, Stacey, the thing he was angry about was that the U.S. government spends money on the space program. Am right. I making that connection right? Okay. Yeah. And so all you guys are excited over these pictures, like you're <laughs> like idiots. Basically, he was saying you're idiots. So, uh, so he makes that comment. So I take a breath. I'm not going to take that bait. 
part of me wanted to go into, you see, if I was as triggered as you, but I didn't do that, I caught myself. So I just said, you know what? The short answer is, and I just said, conservatives stick to each other like glue and liberals rip each other apart. Have a nice night. Went to sleep. The next morning I went up, there's a new post. Same topic, but it uh, you know, talks about if we can do this, why is it our government can't solve homelessness? You know, and he goes through, he words it beautifully. The first thing I go, I put my little heart up there so he knows, because we had some other words as well. Put my little heart up there. Another woman jumps in, says something. I start talking to her. Then I, you know, and then the two of us are like, we are the chain. Why are we counting on them? So instead of like, we're not even beating up the government. Now we're totally pivoting to, yeah, why aren't we doing this? And anyway, I just want to say we can make a difference and we have to help each other. So like me and this woman, we're playing off each other, but behind the scenes, things were happening. So I wanted to share that whole thing because, oh, and that tied back to uh, Jerry, when I asked you about your friend Marshall, because Marshall sent something really good in the um, OGM email that I didn't have time to respond to. And he was um, re responding to a thread with Klaus and um, it was this preacher. I don't know, Ken, do you remember that email? Um, there's this oh preacher. yeah yeah michael dowd yes uh, the guy who wrote thank god for evolution and it's like that's the population that i could talk to that we could talk to because finding systems thinkers in that population what's clear to me watching everything and oh i'm just curious about saying i'm not there's no judgment here but can you can you just raise your hand if you've ever read what i wrote on through the eyes of facebook what i learned about myself and the world around me. I just want to see if you if you've ever read that. That doesn't sound like a familiar essay to me, Stacey. Not one hand. Ooh. Isn't that interesting? That's the one big piece of work that I've wrote. I've written. I've been in this group for two years. It's an important piece of what I have to say. Not one of you have read it. The same Stacey, people. Where, where, where was it, Stacey? Oh, I've posted it on Facebook. I put it in chats. I've talked about it. I've referenced it. Not a lot because I don't push so, my thing. So Stacy, Stacy, yeah. hold your horses. Yeah. I'm not upset. No, no, no. I, I, I know, <laughs> but but I just want to say I clearly have read it and I put it in my brain under you. Uh, and back in October 2020, right? Um, but Facebook to me is like a sieve, like it's just a bunch of social posts. It's not a place where things stick very well. And I guess this is on Medium because this is a Medium link. So you posted it there? Yes, it was an article I wrote on Medium. Okay, about, good, which, which, I, which I didn't remember or realize. Uh, but uh, I just, I, you know, so I will, I will post this link to the chat uh, so we have it, but this will, I, I think we need to refresh people uh, thank you, Pete. You're faster than I am. Thank you, Pete. And again, I'm just, I'm really saying it to make a point. Yeah. I'm really just trying to make a point, honestly. So I'll, I'll stop there. And uh, Gil, you had your hand up a moment ago. Um, yeah, I, I did, but I, uh, I, hmm. yeah. That's... I want to hear from other people first, but I just want to ask one question in the uh, in the spirit of this guy Ken Homer, who I learned from. Um, I've heard of him. Yeah, Stacey, you 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 used we a lot in your opening, and I want to calibrate who is we that you're talking about. When I which what, what sentence was I using? Well, when I was you, talking about. Oh, I know what I was. Saying. Are you talking about the people on the screen, the people in OGM, the people in the climate movement, the people on the left, the people in America, the people in the I world? Use, I mean, we, we use "we" very fluidly, moving in and out of all those. Yeah. Um, when I used the word "we," I was explaining when I was on that Facebook post with that woman and the man who decided to change what he wrote. Mm -hmm. Instead, of, so when he was saying, "How come the government hasn't done this?" I yep. use we to create an, um, a, a community to try to say we can do this together, meaning okay. the 
people I was talking to. So now I was talking to you and I was saying, let's play this game. We can do this. Come on, come on, guys. We can do this. I'm talking about us. That's not the same as saying we believe because that's a whole different thing. I know when to use we and when not to use we. Gotcha. It's about discernment. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Ken? I just want to say the old, if the government can put a man on the moon, why can't we do X is really worthless in terms of a framing because we're very good at handling technical issues. We're not for good at handling social issues. We're not good at handling things that have high social complexity, which is extraordinarily different than, you know, putting a space telescope behind the sun. Um, so for whatever that's worth, when you're talking to this person, we need to distinguish between technical issues and adaptive challenges. And if we have to change our minds, that's completely different than learning how to how to put a piece of technology somewhere. Um, and it doesn't quite work the same way. Thanks, well, Ken. Can I respond? Yeah, please. Stacy, then go. Well, two things. Number one, I don't think I need to change the approach because the approach actually worked perfect for what I was trying to do. Um, the whole mood of that group became one of it, the whole, the energy neutralized. There was no anger. There was no fighting. I didn't have to worry about him insulting and separating the people who normally would agree because I had explained they were allies. So I didn't have to change the approach. The other thing I wanted to point out is in the language. If the government can is looking at what the government can do and then saying, then why can't we? So now you're looking at we, why can't we do something? But you were focused on what the government could do. So right there, there's something, the language is telling us that there's a disconnect. So my thing is we need to look at our language. That's, that's where I'm coming from. And Doug Breitbart, I think, connects with me on a lot of things here when it comes to the language. And that's why I am sensitive to the word we as well. Um, Stacey, I just posed a possible sort of reframing of the question you had posed in the chat, which is how might we bridge the we divides, which seems to me what a lot of your uh, life activity and life energy is about. It's like, how do I, how do I engage with people who think differently from me and kind of calm them down and bring them back into conversation in some sense? Yeah. Um, so I don't know if that, if that resonates for you or what. Uh, Gil, did you want to jump back in? Yeah, just quickly to what Ken said about the the differences in the nature of the challenges between, you know, getting to the moon and ending hunger, whichever thing you refer to, Ken. I think it's not just that there are different orders of com complexity of, you know, technical versus social, mental, and so forth, uh, but it's also a question of will. You know, we wanted to get to the moon. Did we want to end hunger? Only the hungry people. Yeah. Different we. Many we's. And as Scott points out in the chat, he says, we or we, O-U-I. Yeah, nice. Shall we try and get back to choosing a topic? Um, thanks, Doug. Uh, do we have any other topic proposals? Um, I, I, Pete had pointed out that I had uh, put a light sentence in as well about how do we explain our mission? How do we explain what we're about? I'm, I'm trying to find better better examples, better ways of lighting in people's heads, what we're up to. Um, so that was a thought. Um, and uh, other thoughts on picking a topic. I would also love to find a better way to have a topic chosen before the next two Thursdays away call so that we end up diving into a topic we've more or less agreed to. I can. Yeah, this comes from conversations with Pete. Um, it strikes me that there's a, a big disconnect between um, the way that we, as in people who are in communities, uh, ordinary folks who come together, uh, whether they're working as part of a team, an organization, or they're, they're a community wanting to do something, or um, and what Pete calls hyperscale structures. Um, so, you know, certain governments, authoritarian figures, uh, some billionaires, um, transnational corporations, their idea of working on behalf of the whole is very different than our idea of working on behalf of the whole. And I'm remembering you know, when I asked Mike Nelson about um, uh, Bill McDonough's 
framework for the next industrial revolution of why why wouldn't people in Washington you know see that as uh, a necessary and useful way to work of to close the loop on industrial metabolism so things don't bleed off into the biosphere and he says like Ken that's so far beyond um, what people in Washington can even think about they they wouldn't be able to wrap their minds around that so that's an example of um, folks in charge of of governments you know they're really trying to to do something very different um, when they look at what is good for the whole. I think their view of the whole is almost always colored entirely by the lens of, of power and perhaps greed or, or other things, but they're not working in ways that are working for all of humanity, for the planet. So is there a way, Pete, I'm going to ask you because you, you're the guy who made this distinguishing uh, distinction of, you know, how do we conduct conversations in uh, hyperscale structures that actually orient us back towards creating a world that's going to uh, be there for all of us. Uh, Doug, please. Yeah, topic. Uh, do we need to be thinking about how to respond to cascading failures? That is, really, do we need a lifeboat strategy now to prepare for what might be coming? And maybe there's a connecting question, which is, is it is it large scale crises that will catalyze the kinds of changes across the we divides that Stacy is pointing to? Do we need to, does it need to get that, does the, does the fire need to get that close? We might already have a consensus about that. <clears throat> um, among whom? Uh, we. <laughs> <laughs> That was a setup. The that was, people thank on you, the screen. Thank you for thank you for taking the layup. <laughs> um, Hank, uh, about uh, responding to cascading failures, I spent uh, four hours yesterday speaking with uh, a very uh, inspired Japanese uh, visitor to the Netherlands, uh, whose life work is uh, uh, looking into how communities can become more resilient to respond to cascading failures. And he does not think that anywhere in the world there is a uh, uh, consensus or agreement on how to do it. Uh, he's hoping to work towards a very practical uh, international meeting on that in Japan next uh, March. He's at the Tohoku University, which is, for those of you who know Japan, in Sendai, where uh, Fukushima uh, and that recent disaster took place. And uh, he accesses uh, international organizations uh, all over the world. No, nobody is thinking about it. Sorry to be negative. But no, that's okay. And I think there's a there's a general complexity that I think we might agree on, which is even if we got everybody to agree the house is on fire and things are urgent, we would disagree a lot on what steps to take next. Um, and maybe even, Doug, I'm not sure, on what a lifeboat would look like. I mean, uh, I've read enough science fiction to know what different kinds of, you know, uh, crisis facing lifeboats might look like from people's imaginations and boy they're different and 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 that our expectations and explanations for what might happen and how to survive it play out in lots of crazy ways uh, Doug did you want to jump back in no okay. uh, the Judy then Gill uh, two comments I wanted to go back to your question about process for determination of topics for discussion. Thanks. And I wonder if it wouldn't work to use Mattermost to submit clusters of topics from individuals and then take a posting of those and vote on them, take your top three kind of thing or your top five to arrive at a synthetic list of potential topics with, with opportunities just as a pragmatic approach. It's not, not perfect, but we could could then discuss what were the top three or whatever we wanted to do in subsequent meetings. Um, in terms of the cascading failures, I'm more interested in what we might be able to take advantage of with the work you've already done with the brain to identify from perhaps our perspective, 
likely areas of cascading failures, which I suspect we would not have a hard time doing, and beginning to assemble the process for providing the background information on those. If we had that background information, then we could do a sort of, we're not in a crisis, but here's a topic you ought to be thinking about reaching out to agencies and groups that would have impact. And I'm thinking that, that sort of strategically, you'd wanna do that in the sense of not reaching out directly to the governmental body that would ultimately have to deal with it, but to identify the appropriate advocacy groups that could carry the ball forward and to provide then additional resources around knowledge content to those groups. Thanks, Judy. Um, to your first point, yes, let's use the Mattermost OGM Town Hall channel for discussing. It would be lovely if someone uh, in our community would volunteer to, to prod us and host that dynamic uh, every other week. Stacy, is, is that you volunteering to do that? Yes. I love that. Thank you very much. So, so that should help us kind of narrow down what topic we'll have before we get to each call. I think that'll be um, really good for us. And then, um, Judy, just a slice of what you, uh, what, all, what, what else you said. Um, it is my hope that um, by collecting up ideas, opinions, different approaches towards solutions, what a life boat looks like, and all that, and then and then meeting in the middle and remixing and connecting the ideas that the options and paths become clearer and get sort of found and and some rough consensus emerges from that remixing. The problem is we're not remixing. We're busy in a knockdown, drag out, you know, uh, fight uh, with no winners uh, in the public sphere. And we don't we don't have an ability to slow down, calm down, as Stacy I think is trying to get us to do, in general at a very at, at a smaller scale. But we're not slowing down enough to stare at these things and go, where do we agree? Where do we disagree? How does this work? How do we find some sorts of, of consensus? Because we're not going to get a lot of consensus. What we're going to end up with is uh, billionaires. It's going to look like don't look up where like some billionaire is going to run some huge gambit that's going to change the Earth's atmosphere in some way that uh, isn't going to work. And then dinosaurs will eat us all in some alternate future. <laughs> Gil, um, can I just jump in before you just because sure, sure. Um, so if we could just build on what Jerry and Judy have said and to add something to the chat, some of us are working on like a real world game. I'm wondering if we can take the next step and if anybody wants to blend some of those topics and write their opinion using some of what's there, that's just an added thing if you want to do it that way. And that would be a way to participate in this game we're hoping to create, like living in the world that way. So I'm just adding that option. And this is also bridging into something else I would love for us to do more of, which is to use more of what it is I think we're building, because we have a lot of conversation that basically floats into the bit bucket on the Google group and a couple of chats, we don't do a lot of curating of that information into massive wikis or other more permanent places where it looks more like Wikipedia and less like a mailing list. Um, so I would love for us to be posting more into medium posts, uh, other sorts of more permanent places outside so that our good ideas don't just float off into the bit bucket, as I said. Uh, back to Judy, then Gil, then John. I was just going to expand on your comment, Jerry, about starting to do the work and taking advantage of what is done, wondering if we might not, it, knowing that it's so hard to get to powers that be on big issues, we should look for any opportunity in any community or scale to take positive action because that action can then be referenced by others in terms of moving the venture to a larger scale. And that's something that we could have more direct impact on more quickly. Thanks, Judy. Um, Gil and John. Yeah, I like going beyond the bit bucket, Jerry. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I'm struck listening to Doug talk about the looming catastrophes, the cascade and failures, and the lifeboat strategy. Um, <clears throat> uh, two thoughts. One is that the um, the preppers and the proto fascists are much more organized than we are. Uh, so the you know so the crisis provoking great breakthrough action doesn't really uh, comfort me because. You know, we're, we're we're not ready for it. The other thing I think about is the, and I don't, I don't know if 
the, the story of the monasteries in the Middle Ages, I don't know if this is a true story, but the, the, the way it got handed down to me is that in those dark ages, uh, the, the, you know, people cloistered in monasteries preserved knowledge that could then reemerge in later times. So I don't know if that's true or not, but that may be some, a metaphor for us to think about here. And maybe that's part about getting out of the bit bucket is to, you know, uh, more, more systematically share what we do think, say, et cetera, with each other in ways that those can be, those can seed out uh, into other people and other communities. Uh -huh. The, you know, the larger question that I keep thinking about these days is, uh, is how do humans learn to live as though we belong to the living world and belong to each other, which is a version of what someone, I think it was Eric posted earlier on, the Rodney King quote of, can't we all get along? I mean, that's gotten cheap in the popular discourse, but it comes down to that at a certain level. Mm -hmm. uh, um, brief historical aside, I think it was in the Ornament of the World uh, by Rosa Maria Menorcal, where I read, uh, and you can find this in lots of other places, but basically uh, there was a big, beautiful library in um, uh, in Iraq. And when the Abbasids overthrew the Umayyads or vice versa in Islam, they basically destroyed the library. But one of the caliphs took a copy of the library across Northern Africa uh, and then up into Moorish Spain, where the original works of Plato, Aristotle, all the Greeks and all that, that had been kind of rescued into that library, um, got translated out into Arabic. And then later, because Castilian Spanish doesn't show up for a while, it's a, it's a late language in all these groups. Uh, there are other languages like Catalan and Languedoc and all those things that are earlier. Um, but so we have we have Islam to thank for the preservation of Greek thinking. And then somehow also there's a copy that the Celts maintain uh, in monasteries out there. And I don't know what I don't know much about that lineage or whatever. But but were it not for those kinds of copy and preserve the original Xerox uh, cultures, uh, we would not have a lot of the works that we consider foundational to Western thinking, which takes yep. me to another tangential thought, which is I can't stand it when people build arguments on top of just Greek uh, Greek logic. I think it's like, good Lord, there's 65,000 years of, of Aboriginal wisdom that they're just completely ignoring. And years ago, I saw Dick Foster give a valedictory kind of speech where he started with Plato and Aristotle and the logic that they built for Western mankind. And I was like, ah, Jesus. So anyway... Just a quick share. Briefly. Yeah, thank you for whacking Greek wisdom. Um, we, there's a, another topic to talk about, what the yeah. predecessors were that get forgotten. Um, more Spain, uh, notably the the Muslims and the Christians and the Jews got along. and yeah. got along richly and well. It was one of the great flowerings in the West um, for, a little, for a little while. Before yep, it got that's started. why the book is called The Ornament of the World. Um, it, it's really, really super and interesting. It's one of those, if you could go back in time and be a fly on the wall in some place, where would you go? And I'd be like, I want to go to Granada or or one of those towns during that era oh, to see what, see mm -hmm. what life was like. Uh, Judy, I think you still have your hand up. So Judy, then John. Oh, sorry, that was a mistake. Uh, excellent. It John. <laughs> OK, uh, me? The floor is yours, yes. <laughs> Great, OK. I came in a little late. I really appreciate the desire, the pressure, if you will, to move us closer to consensus and to move us closer to the effectiveness of the consensus. You know, where can we where can we have impact with uh, our presumably evolved understanding, uh, having put more attention on this than the general public by by quite a large measure, even though we got a lot of company out here in terms of other people also uh, focusing on these issues. So that's on, that's important. I, I appreciate that. And what I'm going to say is going to back up from that and say uh, it's closer to the uh, point I think you were making, Jerry, about how do you encapsulate our, our conversation in, in, a, in a more usable and compressed form. So I got this idea this morning. <laughs> And I, it's too, it was too late to write anything up like this, but I will, I'll do it anyway, but I'm, I'll, I'll share it with you and you'll tell me if you think this is going to be useful at all to the group. Yeah, I've read a lot of those science fiction scenarios and, and I've, and there's a lot of them that I haven't read because they're, they're just some, such an incredible number of them. And the imagination of the people who come up with them is, you know, impressive 
even if you think it's unrealistic. But there's a bunch of parameters. This is what I'm, this is what I'm proposing. I'm proposing a, a, an open-ended kind of scenario. When I say open-ended, it says, okay, it's some time in the future. We haven't fully collapsed, but maybe we have, but we're, we're at least collapsing. It's enough that climate refugees inside the United States are an issue and supply chains are an issue and you know all the other stuff is an issue things are breaking down they're not completely gone yet but they're breaking down and so a groups of people have begun to form to try to have a survivable sustainable regenerative uh, unit and um so what just i have to in a, in a few minutes okay please um what uh I, i'm i'm teasing out issues Okay, so like one issue is, when do you think this will happen? Early, you know, and you, you have a continuum, you have 2025 and 2035, let's say, and, and you just pull the group, you say, where do you think, here's a description of a point we are in time, when do you think this will happen? And the group votes, not to get a consensus, but just to illuminate the thinking about it. Okay, the idea is not consensus, the idea is, oh, should we think about that? But then you proceed, you say, well, how big a group would be sustainable? What's the, what's the minimum size? What's the maximum size? Is it the Dunbar number? Or is that relevant? Okay. Then, um, does, does this group have to protect itself against... Um, involuntary joining by other people and how does it do that and again there's a continuum you know is it is it geographically you know isolated interesting area is it does it have a does it have a barrier and and does it have arms is are there armed people who say look here's the procedure you know you wanted to join us you know, maybe it, it, this, I know this is a terrible analogy, you know, but there's the whole stay in Mexico thing until you're approved. But I mean, even the farm in Tennessee, you know, has this thing. No, 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 you, you stay out here, you know, and we talk about it and, and then you come in and you have a little trial thing and then maybe you come in, you know. So, I mean, some future group, 80 to 150 people, it's even half sustainable. It's going to attract people who are just desperate and who just show up and just say, hey, well, I got to join the group. You got to let me in, you know, and what do we do about that? You know, I mean, so, so I, what, I'm, what I'm describing is a series of issues that a small, sustainable issue, small, sustainable, small, meaning, you know, whatever size works, uh, regenerative community would face and where we think, you know, the content might, it, it might fall, not necessarily what we want. That's a, this is an interesting separation. Separate what you want it to be from what you think it might turn out being. Very important trick in scenario planning. And then you see where you think it might wind up being, and then you can discuss, you can say, wow, we don't have a consensus on that. That's an interesting one. Let's note that we didn't have a consensus on that one. But we did have a consensus, let's say, that you know, somewhere between 100 and 150 people is probably a really you know, good size, and you might want to do something to, you know, stop it at that point. Uh, there's more issues. There's a whole bunch of issues about diversity, diversity of skills, whether you would actually have quotas, whether you'd actually go out and recruit actual farmers from somewhere else, say, no, 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 you need to come here. We'll, we'll subsidize you. You need to come here. Actual, uh, fix it, actual people who are used to fixing things, you know, mechanical things, because I mean, I'm, I'm just worried. Personally, I just I look, I look at this future. And I think about us. And I think a whole bunch of us word loving people are going to want to be in this thing, because <laughs> we're going to see the need for it early. But we don't, among us, have the right distribution of, of physical skills that would be need, needed to make it. So anyway, that's just an outline of a, of a process. I'm going to proceed on this anyway. And then as a future topic, you can decide if you want to go through the questions, vote the question, you know, see, see where you are in the continuum. And then you, and then you discuss the continuum. You don't try to necessarily come to consensus, but you say, that's interesting. Here's our spread on that question. Here's our spread on this other question. 
Okay, thank you. Thanks, John. Um, I just you provoked several different things. I just wanted to tie a couple strange things together. One is that I think part of what you're raising is that in many places now in many conversations, we're busy trying to figure out how to reinvent society or how to populate a lifeboat or how to reboot culture or whatever else. And partly this is because we're facing a lot of global global crises. Uh, partly it's because this is in the air. And, and one, of, one of the thoughts that I care about in my brain is that we're busy, we're in the middle of an involuntary renegotiation of the social contract around the world. Mm. That Arab Spring occupied, Gilets Jaunes, the Trump apocalypse, uh, all a Tea Party, all these different groups are saying, hey, the system is rigged and broken. We need a new system. And we haven't been able to flex or, or break out of the old system that we have. Um, interestingly, the far right has been accusing the left of always wanting to implement Sharia law in the US. And that's why we need to get, you know, make sure Muslims don't enter the country and these terrible liberals. And, and, and I just saw the term Christo-fascism for the first time recently. And in the meantime, you know, the Roberts court, court basically is taking us into a uh, white nationalist Christian uh, theocracy that sort of seems to fall under the, the heading of Christo-fascism, if that's your bent or, or how you want to label it. Um, I'm sure that term will not help open conversations with people who are of that point of view, however. Um, so we have this really interesting mix of, of things on the table. I'm unclear that we've chosen a topic for this call yet, just to, to sort of channel Doug for a moment. Uh, and see whether anybody would like to take a step in to clarify that for us. Or Stacy, if you feel like we have or haven't, or we've wandered too far from the, the seed you planted originally. So well, actually we're right at the right place. We're right at the crossroads. So I'm very relieved to hear that. <laughs> in, in the chat, it was mentioned, where was it? Uh, we're playing in two very different games, very different rules. And this mm -hmm. is what I'm here to say. And this is the point of my article that I asked if anybody had read. We're playing the same game. We're playing by the same rules. We're just looking at it from different points of view and our perspectives different. And to a lot of the chat where we were talking, um, there was some talk about the halves and mixing. So Jerry, I, Marshall, I don't remember his last name. He introduced, okay, so he introduced that Dowd, Father Dowd. Uh, yeah, Matthew Dowd. And earlier in the call, I said, that's the population I want to talk to, because I know in that population, there are better systems thinkers than we sometimes see here. It's not Matthew Dowd, it's someone else, sorry. Oh, I, I will find it, but yeah. I just want to make that distinction. It's not the system, it's Michael the people. Dowd. <laughs> Michael Dowd, thank you. We don't see our, we don't see our own disconnect between the words that we're saying and mm. the actions that we're doing. And to that analogy that John brought up about books, every one of us is a book. There, we already, we're carrying everything we've ever read within us, but yet we're throwing out all this other information. Read about the Greeks, read this, read this, but yet we're meeting a person. And that's why I used me as an example. That one piece tells you who I am, where I came from, how I think, the way I interact, and nobody read it. And I've been your friend for ever. Well, not forever, but so it's just um, an analogy. And well, maybe also um, there are a couple places now, whether it's pro slash catalyst or wikis or whatever, where we put up our personal profiles and say who we are. Do you point to that piece as central to your life on That's any profile any place? It's not important to me. What's important Wait. to me is that you know me. You, yes. You, so I'm talking about something different. I'm talking about relationships. So in that piece, I talk about how I travel to the different Facebook worlds, the land of the radical vegans, the land of the crazy libertarian. I mean, all these different places, and some of them were really hard to be in. They were nasty. I was on Trump sites, but I found friends everywhere I went. And so I do, I mean, but I found the systems thinkers. I found the ones that were reasonable and rational. And I'll tell you what's become more clear than anything, especially watching the hearings, not the commentary, just the hearings and listening to the clips. 
you take any script and put in a different figure, they're all saying the same thing. The script is the same. It's the characters that are changing. Mm -hmm. And now you've got my whole thesis and I just, I'm all, I'm all done. I don't, you see, I don't, I don't have to talk anymore. You know, I can conserve all the- uh... There should be a little mic drop animation in, in Zoom. Um, thanks, Stacey. Uh, Pete. Um, I wanted uh, wanted to do a meta thing, uh, if that's not going to disrupt us from our topic seeking or or from go, go meta, Pete. We can do uh, from Stacy's uh, discussion, <clears throat> conversation, connection. Um, uh, I hope I can share my screen, Jerry. Yes, it should. The default is to let everybody share, so it should work fine. Uh, so some of you might know uh, that I use uh, this thing called HackMD. Um, and I wanted to talk to you, so I'm going to put uh, the link uh, in chat, and you can click that link and see the same thing I'm seeing. <clears throat> so uh, one of the things, I'm going to hit refresh here too. Um, uh, we were talking about essentially persistent memory. So uh, uh, if you go to the link, I think you'll see something like this. And a thing that you can do is click this edit button up here. Uh, and then it turns into this beautiful little thing, which is kind of confusing because there's two copies of stuff and it's dark and I don't like it. Um, the two parts of this are, uh, this is the way we write in Markdown, which looks a lot like an email or something like that. And this is the way it looks when, when it turns into HTML on a web page. Um, so some people use this thing because they can see both kind of. Um, uh, over in Lionsburg and Meta Project Land, uh, Jordan and I talked about um, uh, adding a, a HackMD based um, uh, discipline maybe uh, to meetings. Uh, so I don't think all of us uh, want to be um, want to be typing on this or looking at this during a call, but if you can imagine kind of what has been going on in chat, um, we we have a very active chat. So it scrolls up and scrolls up and scrolls up until you can't see what's going on. Um, so here uh, I can and anybody can who's uh, on this web page um, uh, can just type something like topics we might discuss. Just added something to the bottom of the page. Um, uh, Jerry's added uh, this, this wiki link here. It's a good wiki. Um, so uh, you might kind of notice that this looks a lot like, uh, since Jerry and I can, we've got three people online, uh, Jerry and me, and uh, somebody who, who hasn't registered or hasn't uh, signed in, which is totally fine. Uh, the way this is set up, you do not need to sign in. Um, so you might notice this is a little bit like uh, Google Docs, except uh, a little bit more confusing or a little bit different is actually what it is. It's not really more confusing. It's just a little bit different. Um, so I like Google Docs, and I like when people get uh, together and talk on Google Docs and take notes or something like that. Uh, the reason I like HackMD better is because it fits into a Markdown-based information ecosystem. So uh, HackMD works really good for real-time collaborative editing, and it doesn't work very good for creating a network of pages. So there's a thing called Massive Wiki, which is good at, at making a network of pages. And then this is plumbing, um, but there's a thing called Massive Wiki Builder, which converts a network of, of pages uh, into a website. So um, the reason HackMD is, is kind of front and center in this information ecosystem is because it's really easy for people to start typing on. Um, and it's really, really easy to add it to a, a network of pages. So when I say a network of pages, imagine if we'd had a system of notes like this for every call that we've had and however many 100 or 200 calls we've had, um, we could have a, a network of those pages. Um, Imagine, uh, imagine 200 Google Docs and trying to keep track of them and where they are and how to link them together. Um, that would be hard, I think. 
If you do that in massive wiki, it's a lot easier. It's actually tractable. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the, the reason we're using HackMD is because you can do this real-time collaborative editing thing. Um, when you're done with it, uh, what we typically do is just save it uh, right here. Um, if I click this and find the right place on my, on, on my uh, computer and click Save, I'm, I've literally put it into the knowledge base forever, kind of. There's, there's you know, one or two more clicks to kind of like commit it to the, the web and things like that, but that's about it. So, um, uh, Gil, good question. This is, this is very similar to what Jerry does in his brain. Um, uh, we're using kind of a, a document-based format instead of um, the, the network, you know, brain thing that Jerry has. Um, but it is very similar to what Jerry does. Uh, the difference is uh, we can be a little bit more freeform with the way that we the way that we write things. Um, we can um, we can have headings and other pages and things like that. Um, the big, 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 big difference is that we can have uh, two people doing this at a time, uh, ten people, a hundred people, a thousand people. So imagine everybody on this call. I, I, I'm sure everybody on this call wouldn't participate, but imagine four people on this call doing the thing that Jerry does. Uh, instead of doing it in the network, cool network tool that Jerry does, four people doing this during a call, taking notes and connecting it into the rest of the network of pages that we've got. Um, you know, when we bring up a, a book um, that we, uh, um, <laughs> I wish people would, uh, put, uh, go to this page and type questions down here. Uh, uh, Doc asked a good question too. Uh, uh, OKML is uh, an outline format um, from the golden ages of blogging um, uh, invented by a guy named Dave Weiner, uh, who's- Weiner a whiner uh who's uh, uh brilliant and and um and um still does amazing stuff uh but and he gifted us a, a wonderful tool um uh that kind of didn't stand the test of time um but uh the short answer um the short answer doc is that this doesn't talk opml and and wouldn't really um, it talks Markdown, which is more uh, standard nowadays um, mm -hmm. and more flexible and used for more things, kind of. So OPML didn't win. Um, Markdown is one of the winners, one of the short number of winners. So um, I, I talked about saving this uh, into a network of pages. And it turns out we actually have a network of pages already on the web. So you can go to this uh, uh, this on the web and look at it as a website. Um, we, we haven't done a lot of work on this. Uh, so it's, it's the, the navigation is not great. Um, I'm going to cheat and do a thing called all pages here. Um, we used to take some notes like this. So here's Thursday calls from, uh, uh, from, uh, 2021. Uh, I don't know if these are going to be good or bad. Uh, this is mostly me probably taking notes. Imagine if we had this for every call instead of, uh, you know, six calls back in 2021 when when Pete was felt like doing it. Um, uh, you can talk about, you know, random stuff that comes up and save it forever. Um, uh, this is another another uh, wiki, uh, Jordan especially, Jordan and uh, Jonathan and me and Bill Anderson have spent some time on the Lionsburg wiki. Um, Jordan has gone great guns in it and he's got just a ton of stuff that he's mostly kind of copied over from other writings he's got, um, but it's, um, it's going really well. Um, and uh, you can do things like have home pages for subgroups of, of a thing. Uh, so this is kind of a list of groups that we're talking about having in the meta group. And uh, I know this is a decent page. So this is kind of a profile page for um, uh, for the infrastructure group. You can also do profile pages for. So, so Pete, yep. before you keep going down, popping down uh, paths, uh, um, 
what Pete is showing is a, like an illustration of the infrastructure we already have for the question I asked earlier, which is why don't we um, post things in a place that's more durable, et cetera. And we've tried to take our chat that we have going here, which is pretty frothy in Zoom and move it over to Mattermost. So it'd at least be durable in Mattermost, which is different from this background. And that didn't really work. We couldn't, we couldn't really sort of police ourselves to stay in Mattermost. <clears throat> and then we have many a meeting where people are trying to take notes in things like HackMD, which works and doesn't work. And I'm, I'm very interested in this dynamic and, and how, uh, how it all plays out. But I'm not sure, <clears throat> but I wanna mind that we were on a different path before uh, this detour and see where the group would like to head back to. Um, um, I'll, I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Jay. Um, I, I'm not suggesting, so, you know, we've got a number of places we've kind of experimented with. Uh, we experimented with the forum um, and uh, we didn't get enough activity there to, we got a lot of activity, but we, we couldn't quite organize the activity to get it going. So it's actually archived right now. It's decommissioned. Um, OGM Wiki is kind of more abundant too, of course. Uh, we could be using tools like this. Um, we don't, um, and that's cool. Um, but we could. Happy to happy to show people more. And thank you for that, Pete. Um, and there's this ongoing question I have, which is, how does more of what you just showed happen for more conversations in more different communities in a way that allows those notes to meet and blend and bridge and reproduce and cause other kinds of action and conclusions. Um, and I think that's a I think that's still kind of a thorny question because of the geeky nature of, of the tools we're working with. Uh, it's not it's not easy and, and obvious like posting to Instagram is easy and obvious, right? Um, cool. Um, Mr. Nelson, thanks for joining us. I apologize. As usual, I have a conflict for the first half hour. But yeah, exactly. Uh, if we can throw out an idea, if I can throw out an idea, which builds on this general discussion about how do we make more information more available to more people in more useful forms while protecting <clears throat> that information that needs to be protected. I, I wonder if people have heard of Sandy Pentland at MIT and uh, his whole idea of data cooperatives or data unions, uh, not like labor unions, data unions like credit unions. And his, his core concept is that <clears throat> we can somehow share data within a, 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 a network of vastly distributed data centers and, and, uh, and organizations and, and rather than trying to collect all the, suck all the data into a giant data ocean and then crank on it with some software, you send the software to all this distributed data and you never have to actually share the data beyond the confines of the organization. And yet you can suck out really interesting insights by putting the software against the data sets. Um, it's a radical rethink of how we normally govern data, but I'm just curious if anybody has been following this. He, he, he's also talking very uh, ambitiously about a Bretton Woods for data, some way in which na national governments can agree to uh, manage their data and share their data more effectively. As long as we don't have to couple our data to each other in a snake, I think I'm okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I, so Sandy Pentland is a genius and I know him from a bunch of other stuff. I didn't realize how much he's going down the data union path. And clearly I just shared my brain and I had one talk of his about data unions. This whole idea of data commons, data unions, data trusts is another thing that's yeah. out. Um, and I don't have enough depth in any of them and I'm really interested in all of them. So I'm, in, I'm wondering if anybody else in this group has more experience and would like to jump in. Um, you forgot the European term, which is data space. And they're actually putting it into legislation, even though they have no clear idea of what it is or what isn't a data space and what is a data space. But it, the, the, again, the concept is you, you have some way to uh, manage who's accessing the data and you have the ability to work on data without 
changing who's got control of the data. Right. Um, and preserving different people's perspectives into the data, et cetera. Uh, yeah. Scott. Uh, just, just one oh, more thing. Uh, uh, Mike, one, go ahead. If you want an introduction to what Sandy's thinking about, <clears throat> uh, they have a, there's a book from MIT Press called Building the New Economy. And uh, his introductory chapter does a nice job. There's, there are other chapters on data trusts and what might be necessary to accomplish this grand vision, but um, it's, it's the best thing I've seen. As what, his talks are actually the best thing, and, you know, but um, the book is, is quite useful. In fact, I have that book above the talk that I just posted. Okay. Um, go ahead, Scott. Um, I'm, I have a distinction I think might be helpful. And I hadn't really written it down before, but um, what I'm noticing is that, Jerry, I think you've talked and used lots of different terms about the, uh, the Facebook feed, the Instagram feed, the Twitter feed, and kind of this uh, ongoing stream that you dip into, right? And that it, it is a, your opinion of that, your takeaway from that, your value from that is in the aggregate. It's kind of a trend. Okay, I'm seeing things about this, I'm seeing things about this, and they're gone. You know, in a sense that like, okay, you, you're probably not saving Twitter posts. Oh, I do. Oh, OK. All right. Well, yeah, yeah. maybe there's some significant. So, the reason I went Matt was yeah. well, it's not so I, I get a gestalt, which I agree with, but I'm also plucking nuggets from the stream mm -hmm. and putting them in my own quirky memory. So Great. so I'm getting a lot of detail and a lot of specifics as small as a tweet, as big as a book or a movie yep. or whatever. Uh, yes, both. OK, so let, let me I think this will make more sense when I finish my distinction, um, cool. which so the first one is sort of this, the gestalt, the aggregates, perhaps you're pulling multiple things from there and kind of making an, an opinion or, or getting a value out of it that way. I see that as our notes on the calls, our forums, you know, there are these, these even the emails where there's lots of replies. It's just this continual thing where you get this kind of sense out of the aggregate. And then there's a Wikipedia page, which is one page that is edited and edited and edited and refined and debated and, and that kind of thing, but it's always one place. So the, the aggregate is taking place in a single location. And so, at least for me, that seemed like an important distinction between, you know, when I approach a Twitter feed or something or a forum or something like that, I'm kind of sifting through it in one way, but it's hard to get a sense of where did we land? because the topic kind of went, maybe it went in different directions and it's fun to read, it's great. But when I want to actually understand what it is, the Wikipedia format to me feels like a better, it's like, okay, here's the current, in a sense, here's the current thing. Now, that means that some of the old opinions might've been struck out and rewritten and, and that kind of stuff. But it seemed like it was an important distinction between two ways of, uh, presenting things. We have our chat in the Zoom, and then we end up with one page that says this is this is that thing that's evolved over time. I, I'm not exactly sure where to go with that, but that's kind of where what I wanted to say. Thanks, Scott. And I think you've opened up a, a very interesting Pandora's box, which is a different, we're in a different topic now than we started our call on. And I love this topic is the problem. Uh, um, and I think also this is very much like the blind men describing the elephant, where for each of us, we'd have a different flavor and a different approach toward what we would love to have or see. And I'm happy to articulate how I feel about these kinds of things. Um, uh, one tiny reflection, Scott, uh, there's a peer-to-peer -peer wiki, which uh, Michelle Bowens and his team of collaborators created over time, which basically took the, I think they used the Wikimedia platform, same platform as Wikipedia is built on. And they built out this gigantic wiki, which is full of tremendous information, which I never go to because it's very long pages of information. It's basically long reads after long reads after long reads. And for me, 
a really good concise page is still like a really long page and is not nuggetized. And one of the little problems I have with shared notes on a call like this is that my brain wants to break up all the ideas and point to sub pages that connect to sub pages. I'm, I'm in my head, I'm weaving a series of nuggets that are in, a, in Indra's net in basically a web of ideas connected and trying to improve each nugget so that when you go to the nugget about how the caliphate in Moor Spain saved the classics from Greece and, and Rome, which I realized in my brain I don't have right now. So I need to, at the end of this call, I'm going to go back and do a little reorganizing so I have more of a nugget for that thought so I can tell that story properly and then connected to all the different pieces of, well, the Abbasids overthrew the Umayyads, the capital of Islam moved from Baghdad to Damascus, and then this happened, and then this happened, which you can also sort of follow through in a timeline or historic way. And all these things need to exist in the same data trust, data commons, data space, data, whatever we want to call it. It's complicated as hell. So uh, sorry, I just put like four different kinds of things uh, in the conversation. But if you want to react to any of that, Scott, then otherwise I'll go to everybody else in the queue. I think my only reaction is that what you've shown to me is that reminded me that yours is actually the granular plus the one place. Yep. Uh, and that one of the things I love about the brain is that it gives me this zoom of being able to see the headlines and then dive into the context and see the actual articles beneath it at the same time. And any tool that will also do that, I love. And I'm trying to figure out what does a common tool look like that lets us kind of do that together. So let, let's go Doug, Judy, Michael, Gill. So one of the things I'm feeling here is the tide that's pulling us from conversation to data. Mm -hmm. And those are really two different worlds. Mm -hmm. And I feel actually threatened by the loss of the conversation as we talk more about data. Mm -hmm. We've gone meta, we've taken a, a, a meta detour. Uh, thanks, Doug. And let's see what uh, Judy, Michael, quick, and Bill. Quick differentiation between information and data. <laughs> no, it, conversation and data. Well, um, uh, I think data is really important. Um, the uh, my markdown ecosystem um, uh, is full of uh, not data, but information, knowledge, and wisdom. So I, I appreciate convers and conversation. Actually, wikis are um, an amazing conversation tool. Um, uh, but just to note, uh, the polls aren't or the, the polls aren't necessarily the, the most interesting part. You can go from conversation through wisdom, knowledge, information, data, and you want that whole spectrum. And but I agree. By conversation, conversation is, is I don't important. mean characters on a screen. I mean us actually talking with each other, voice, feeling. Uh, vo I agreed, except that the converse, if, if all we have is conversation, if all we are is oral culture, uh, we have a really hard time thinking together and especially remembering together. And, you know, I, I got, if, if I, I had a wad, magic wand and could wave like, you know, everything away except for oral culture, I might do that. I, I love oral culture. That's humanity. That's being human. But to, to another thing that humanity and human means is that we can actually remember stuff that was you know thought of and written of 20 years ago 40 years ago 100 years ago a thousand years ago um yeah. and especially in this group we're really good at conversation we have the the kind of the attention span of a gnat and the, and the memory of of jerry and you know we can sip through jerry's uh you know straw into his brain and we can't remember things we, we have a really difficult time remembering things as a group. And so my, my argument is that probably I, you know, let's have conversation. Let's try to remember some of it. Let's try to remember just a little bit of it. Even we don't, we just don't. And I have a thought in my brain that says we are an amnesic civilization as a result of that. Um, so uh, Judy. Well, this is a fascinating but somewhat confounding conversation today, and I love it. Um, what I'm trying to think about is how do we separate or identify the, the spectrum, the points in the spectrum where we want to reside from the granular information of the rich data that is subject to new or reanalysis 
to the you know step up levels to integrated pictures and another yet level would be how do we influence or share that with other people and this is just it's too big to take on in that huge massive picture and have meaningful progress but i think that one of the things that we have the opportunity to do is really consider how to approach the levels of influence that we would want to approach with the levels of information that those points of influence would be able to understand, appreciate, and act upon. And that's where I think there's a unique opportunity for this group with the richness and diversity of experience to begin to think of, I would say, pivot points or leverage points and how to actually approach those leverage points to begin to have influence. And in some cases, it has to be done small because it's an experiment and we don't know if the experiment will work. In other cases, there's a greater boundary of what of information. And, and we're in a position where we could take examples to an influencer who could then cascade it to more implementation than we'd be able to contemplate. And Judy, I think you're describing something that I keep trying to do or search for, which is what is the the wrapper, the packaging, the envelope, the container for what <laughs> message that will communicate these kinds of things across these community boundaries? Do, is it a video? Is it an animation? Is it a game? Is it a what? I don't know, but I'm I'm always sort of sniffing toward uh, how do we how do we tell what we know to other people in a way that will connect and absorb and will bridge that we divide in different ways. It, it seems to me that that if you want to engage human action. There has to be a level of personal interaction and trust in order to earn the respect of the other individual to perhaps consider joining you or taking what you're saying to a different group. And that's the part that sort of defies technology a little bit. Although Zoom is pretty remarkable at being able to impersonate live contact with humans, witness this conversation. And this is a conversation with diverse individuals with extremely rich backgrounds that they bring to the table. It's just that I think trying to take that out to communities, which I very much want to do, I can take it in a semblance, my dissection of it to this board that I'm on or this educational committee I'm on or whatever. And each of us can do that, but it's not getting us the impact that we want from a massive dendritic effort. And it might be worthy of some focused calls on strategies for dissemination or strategies for engagement or something of that like. I think we could have some really rich discussions and run some social experiments in, in parallel. Uh, this might make a good topic for a call two weeks from now or a pop-up call in between. I like this a lot. Um, and you're bringing up the point that Doug Carmichael put in the conversation a moment ago, which is this is really about humans meeting with humans. This We need to build trust. This is about human interactions, which I totally agree with. Um, and then now and then I stumble across something like the, the YouTube celebrity uh, who posts as contrapoints, Natalie Wynn, who basically uses framing and uh, lots of production values in her videos to talk to the people on the far right and try to disarm them and, and talk to them in a way that will work for them with all different logics. And I really admire and appreciate uh, the way that she goes about it. And she's creating media artifacts that float around in YouTube, which are not at all about personal interactions. Uh, and in fact, the characters, she sort of plays multiple roles in some of her own videos. She'll, you know, do lots of quick cuts between herself and different, like, that's not a conversation at all. It's performative, but it still plays a role in this funny little mix we're talking about, I think. Um, thanks, Judy. Uh, Michael, then Doug. Um, I have too much to say, so I'm not going to say much, but, um, but I do think that there's something related to what Scott was saying and, and going back to your brain, Jerry, and thinking about these calls. Um, the solutions, it, it's hard for any of us who curate to do much good by pulling, pulling stuff into a space that other people have to visit. And um, figuring out 
ways to annotate in common space so that a single interaction with a single piece of information is valued with, you know, Jerry, you know, the, the stamp of approval or not, or at least interest that is, this appears in Jerry's brain, shouldn't be something that can only be found out if you know about Jerry's brain and go to Jerry's brain and dig it up, you know, for, for the, and this gets into trust graphs and reputation systems, but also, you know, having, having um, true public spaces as opposed to the public spaces, the, the town squares of, of, of Twitter and Facebook that as Doc says, you know, are, are ad driven and attention seeking, um, that you can go to a kernel of information by virtue of the fact that it has been tagged by people you trust um, is something that can't live under any platform. Um, and, and finding that common language, you know, it's the holy grail, I know, but um, I, I just, I feel like uh, organizations like the Collaborative Technology Alliance and, and you know, people who are interested in, in interoperable and, and, you know, the existence of Mastodon and, and in some ways solid, there, there are lots of stuff, things hovering around this, um, but it can't be pulled into something, these granular interactions and, and approvals and trusts and comments have to be pushed out. Um, yeah, just wanted to say that, so thanks. Michael, thank you. That, that was really helpful in lots of different ways. And I kind of want to hear all the rest of the things that are webbing around in your in your head. Um, Doug B. I think actually Gil was ahead of me. He hadn't popped up his hand, but. Uh, Gil, would you like to jump in? Just want to I check. Would, I'm, thanks, Doug. I'm going to pass for now. I'm like Michael, too much to say, so I'm not going to say anything. OK. Um, yeah, so so um, I I tend to bring everything down to cases. And so the the primary question is what's the mission or goal of OGM? Like why is everybody here? Uh in serve what are what is everybody collectively in service to if that's been articulated or defined? And, um, and part of the reason I'm raising that question is because there are a lot of different altitudes for looking at the world and co-creating together. And um, there's no judgment about which one is the one, but um, I'm preoccupied with the cycle of manifestation that starts with space and all things possible and bringing things to ground in something concrete. And, and where um, it just went for a moment, which was this idea of how, how, how is it possible to galvanize on a grassroots viral bottom up level um a collective leveling up of awareness and consciousness and connection between people um because uh without that we don't make it and um we're starting disaggregated and polarized so uh how on an on, on an accelerated viral exponential internet speed level, is it possible to really um, catalyze that awakening in as many people in as short a period of time as humanly possible in service to uh, catalyzing a, a collective response that has some rationality and coherence to it? And um, that is living for me as the low hanging fruit 
like as the as the the thing that has to be figured out quick. Um, and I'm looking at the folks that did figure out how to do that with their own agendas, you know, with with uh, I, I think the the extreme right um, in 2016 um, had a young lady with a vision for data analysis and 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 targeting and you know using technology staggeringly effectively to you know convert 80 million people uh, into fear and terror and conspiracy theories and, and like really good at that now the thing is they did that like we can look at what they did and go well that's an interesting tool in the box like that's an interesting mechanism that we know works and how many others are there that are like that so um from a like rubber meets the road doing something standpoint i think you know one one group of people is about that is about the technical practices the other is about uh, the performative dimensions of media and communications today it's a different world and another group is about catalyzing awakening without contaminating the pool or stirring in an agenda because i also believe if you want to empower and awaken people you can't also uh, <laughs> manipulate them and attempt to assert any kind of control and authority over where they go with the power you've awakened <laughs> like those are inconsistent vectors um so the data thing for me um intrinsically and I hugely value, Jerry, what you've done with your brain. And, and I hugely value and appreciate, Pete, your orientation around it. Um, the thing about data and curation and archives, and Sam Hahn and I have battled this for five years, um, is that intrinsically in and of itself, it has zero life and value and energy. It doesn't mean anything. The only time it means something is in the moment of people in real time in present moment co-creating together and there being something in that archive that is is relevant and so jerry becomes the human link to this unbelievable wellspring <laughs> and connects those dots and goes i got this and um I'm not quite sure why we haven't figured out how to be able to automate that so that, you know, real time transcription to pattern matching and, 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 you know, relatively low level text recognition and analysis correlation to database and a, 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 a light goes off in the corner that says, you know, you guys were talking about this three months ago, want to see what you were saying then. Um, but it's in application in real time in present moment that it becomes valuable. Like that it enriches in colors and adds to the creation in the moment. And so that's a, a piece of the puzzle. And, I, and I'll stop there. I didn't mean to run on that long. Hmm. Thanks, Doug. We really appreciate that. Um, got a whole bunch of things turning in my head. Um, Mark then Stacy. Um, I love the book Dreaming in the Dark by Starhawk, um, a witch from the Bay Area. And I think in the foreword or one of the first chapters, she talks about how it's so much easier to kick over a trash can. And I believe that what the social media on the right has been doing is can be compared to that. Um, if everybody puts their trash in the trash can, um, it's so much easier for the trash collector to pick it up. But if the trash is spread off over an acre, it just multiplies the difficulty of putting that trash away. And if we're talking about cleaning the planet, um, 
I like that metaphor. I think that there's a lot of people going around kicking over trash cans. And I find that social media is great for that. And it may not be as good as the other integrative, co-creative notion of putting all that trash in one place so it can be effectively and efficiently picked up. Um, on a side note, uh, the Internet Archive has been charged uh, by October for creating something called the Library of Democracy. Um, I asked who's the audience and I didn't get a reply. So that's my metric of, yeah, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> so, um, but if anybody has ideas, I'd be happy to uh, listen to them and forward to them. And the, basically, you know, one of my questions would be, huh, given that, you know, there are many people who want to contribute how to make contribution simple, easy, certainly, you know, I say the words the library of democracy and many people here would have all kinds of different ideas, but how do I get them in? How do I get them to pass? Um, how do I make them Brewster compatible? <laughs> so it's, it's the like term that-, that uh, It's like plug uh, and play, only different. Yeah, the, the underground term that uh, some of the employees have. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, a very interesting conversation, but there's, uh, you know, I, I have my own brain uh, that I've been working on since 1984, and I haven't found a partner yet to develop it. I haven't found one other person to basically say, Mark, I think you're going in the right direction. And um, it's not that I want to basically share my own information, but um, the presenting a tool where people can stop and think, creating a situation where people basically take time to reflect on their own mind rather than look outside. Um, certainly, yes, we all look outside. So we all have media, we all have friends, but the important integration of that information, say dreaming, um, one can do consciously, one can say, aha, what do I understand about democracy? What do I understand about, understand about co-creation? And how do I understand it myself before, before trying to convince other people that, that I know what I'm doing? <laughs> because I certainly don't. Um, anyway, um, thanks for listening. And uh, my email is this mark.caranza at gmail.com. Uh, if, you, if you want to drop that in the chat. I'll drop that in the chat. Copy, copy paste. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. And the library of democracy sounds really interesting. And I can think of 12 things I'd love to contribute to it. So um, cool stuff. Thanks. Uh, Stacy. we're getting close to the end of the call time. You may end up having the last void here. You're muted, however. So we won't hear anything you say until you hit that little button. All right. Well, I'm not going to finish my typing. A um, couple of things real quick. Um, to go to Doug's point, I just want to share that. So I was in that group and I still go to talk because there's a relationship there. Didn't work out the way I wanted because there was no structure in place where I could go back to the recordings, pull out the things I needed to bring to my people. So all of those different spots along Facebook were all the different ones that needed a different message. Had there been something to help me do that? I would have been able to do that, but there's nothing to help me. Um, it's funny because I was in a call with Doug once. It was a private call with uh, Gertrude. I can't remember her last name, but it was like a, you know, a healing thing. And they saw me as Sisyphus pushing up a rock, which is really what it feels like. But that's another topic. Um, 
the whole thing about books as people and um, the way we think, and even the way we're, uh, there are so many things about the system we're operating in. For example, um, Mark, I have ideas. Eric put in the chat that he would like to have a call. I was about to say I'd love to do that. And I was going to say this could work in with some of the ideas that are coming up, like Judy mentioned moving to matter most, which I really like the idea because I'm already seeing how that could be an experiment for some of the things that I've been proposing in the meta project, because I know we need those spaces. I don't think we're looking at the economy. I mean, we need a place to sell what we have, to take what we have. Anyway, there's a lot of things to talk about, but people only want to listen to certain people and the very same people that I right <laughs> the very same people that I hear saying we need to you know do this in diversity but when diversity steps in nobody cares so yes we are all books so as I had a wonderful conversation with Jack Park and he we agreed on so many things and he was able he was like you know this sounds like this and he and I was able to explain to him, I already knew that when I meet you, anybody in this group, when I meet you, I'm seeing you and what you stand on your foundation, every book you've read, I already see that in you. That's who you become now. I don't care where you started from. That's not as important who you are now. So when Scott talked about the Wikipedia, how he likes it, it may be different. There may be some things that aren't there that's actually a good thing. Those things have been weeded out. So if you believe that the constitution is a living document, then Wikipedia should be a living document. We grow, books grow, people grow, blah, blah, blah. I wish somebody would help me to put these ideas together and blend. But as a woman, I'm going to tell you, I feel like nobody i feel like i'm in this alone and i want to point out and i know you're trying and i do and different people are trying really hard thanks mark i re these things mean a lot the emojis mean a lot um i wish wendy mclean was here she really supports me and judy i i i'm really glad you're here and because it's hard for women to support other women because we're trying to tread water on our own <sighs> Um, Michael, you're a great support. Thank you. Peter, thank you. Eric, I mean, there's, there's a lot. Jerry, you're trying, I mean, look, everybody does the best they can do and everybody's trying, me too. Sometimes I get worked up because if you look at it as how much force it takes to do something, of course I'm gonna get heated up. I'm using a lot of energy to try and do something. But when I see the camaraderie, camaraderie with men, Gil says something, Ken cheers him on, Ken says something, Doug cheers him on, everybody's there, yes, 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 and that's wonderful. But it's that same tribalism that you see in all the other groups with different things. I have something to say, I have a message, it's been out there, nobody read my book. And it wasn't even a book, it was a short little thing. And that, and again, some of you will walk away and you'll say, boy, she got so upset. What's wrong with her? When things build up, that's what happens. And with climate changes that are gonna come and people frustrated and angry, you ain't seen nothing yet. So we better get on this. And I'm complete <laughs> for now. Thanks, Stacey. Sure. Um, let's just go into silence for a moment. We're at the end of our call. Uh, I will wrap with just showing a resource I have, but it's not, it's going to distract from the moment we have right now. So let's just go quiet for a bit. I'll bring us back out.
Um, thank you. Uh, let me do just a quick screen share just so people know something's around. Here are my notes from today's call. <clears throat> um, this is a scroll bar, so there's more up here. Here are all the calls we've done. And so here's the December 23rd, 2021 check-in call. Here are my notes from then. This is a link to that video online. The chat is pasted in the notes field. Uh, all of these I've been pasting in the Mattermost channel that used to be called OGM Calls, which is now called OGM Town Hall. Uh, every blessed one of these is in there and uh, available. And we, we've done lots of different experiments from Pete's buzzsaw or chainsaw to, to filter URLs out of Zoom chats to a bunch of other things to try to create the more singing, more dancing scenario that Doug B mentioned a moment ago. Like, why can't we point right directly to the place in the call three months ago where we said X about X? I think we're, we're, we're like leaning in that direction, but the resources are here to, to build on. And I, at least me personally, I'm really eager to do the building and do some of the thinking about what needs to be built and to talk to communities that are already building part of these solutions and to try to bring them into the pot and stir and see uh, which of these things click into place, how we actually build sort of scaffold up this thing that we have trouble describing. It's like when, I don't remember if it was Eric or who was, was describing like, oh, so this thing in the middle that isn't a, a blog post, but is something else like, oh uh, yeah, that, that ineffable thing. I call it the big fungus, just to have a funny thing, a funny term to call it, because, because I feel like a lone ant at the fungus face trying to feed the fungus so that it'll nourish us. Um, and if we all picked up our trash, metabolized it, I mean, and put it on the fungus to metabolize, um, we would then have, I think, some more interesting artifacts uh, to share together. Um, thank you very much. We, this was a really interesting sort of bifurcated then, then kind of self-healing conversation toward the end. Uh, Lots uh, was here and Eric is indeed a fun guy. It's very funny. <laughs> uh, exactly. But uh, thank you all very much for, for being here. I really appreciate all the, the time and heart we spend here. Well, I wanted to mention one other thing, which is that Open Global Minds mission is kind of about collaborative sense making and is kind of geeky. Uh, we also own openglobalheart.com, which we've put nothing on mm -hmm. and is more toward what Stacy and Doug C and others were bringing into this conversation about, hey, folks, it's really about showing up with heart and, and vulnerability and making connections uh, with other humans. So thank you all. See you on the Mattermost, where we'll discuss the topic for the call two weeks from now and more.